Good morning, family. <laughs> it is so good to be here and to see you all in person. Uh, most Sundays I'm watching online, and um, except last Sunday. Um, you guys had your own miracle of its own sort. Um, and, um, but I was so glad to be able to watch it later um, and um, on YouTube and to hear that great message that Pastor Andrew preached about perseverance. What a message and what a time. I was, be, to be honest, you know, to admit, I was a little jealous, okay? Uh, you guys like just didn't let anything stop you from worshiping and got candles and some of the video that's online is so beautiful the stuff that's on Facebook of you guys just persevering. It's like you're going to preach it, but we're not just going to preach it. We're going to do it. And, um, and to see uh, how God just flowed into this place. And so I'm honored to be here today with you and to be able to declare the second installment of this message in the series, series of Big God, Big Stories. I'm so glad that we got to hear a little bit about Noah last week. But this week, my assignment is to talk about Moses and the Exodus. Many of us, we know the story of Moses. We has seen the movies, uh, The Prince of Egypt, which is the cartoon version, which I really like, and uh, some of the things that happen in there are just phenomenal. Uh, but then, you know, you got Mr. Heston, who played the best Moses that ever lived, you know? And he came down with the tablets. I was like, who? And his hair was white. I was like, whoa, man. That was my grandma's Moses, but he was my Moses too, okay? And so uh, today, I just want to look a little bit at his life. We know his story for the most part. He was uh, one who was rescued during a time where uh, many babies uh, were slain. Uh, he was uh, sent away in a basket uh, and ended up in Pharaoh's house, was raised by Pharaoh's daughter as um, her own. And Moses grew up, and he was a prince of Egypt, and he experienced all of the goodness of being in the house of Pharaoh. And then eventually, he started to see all of the things that were happening around him and he was not pleased with those things and how the people who were enslaved were mistreated and one day it ended up that he ended up taking someone's life because of that mistreatment. This led him to be um, a person running, running from Egypt and running uh, to other areas to get away from his past and his history. But know this, that when we run away from things, you will always run into God. And so he runs into God and in this space and God calls him and says, I'm calling you to go back and to deliver my people out of Egypt. Like, wow, God, literally, I'm just trying to get away. I just want to do my own thing for a little bit. But one thing is you cannot outrun God. You may try, but God will find you and he will arrest you and bring you into the place that he is destined for, for you. And so Moses goes through this whole scenario to where he is delivering or delivering this message to Pharaoh and let him know, hey, let my people go, let my people go. Pharaoh was like, no, no, no. He said, let my people go. Sounds like a rap. That's really cool. And, um, and so it went on for a little while and then eventually uh, Pharaoh started seeing all these plagues and he's like, okay, enough of this stuff. I got to let these people go. Not only that, he lost his uh, son and, and his heir. And so there was so much that was going on and it literally was Pharaoh against God. It wasn't Pharaoh against Moses because the Lord was fighting for Moses. And so the Bible uh, helps us to understand about a little bit about trusting in God because Moses had to trust that what God said he was going to do was going to do. He showed up in Egypt and God said, I'm going to be there with you. I'll help you get these people out of there. And Moses had to trust. But today I want to talk from the idea of thought, why trusting is so hard? Why trusting is so hard? And then a subtopic is waiting under the weight. First, I want to say to you this morning is that your challenge is a part of God's plan. Your challenge is is a part of God's plan. Whatever you're facing today is a part of God's plan. God has planned some things that are challenges for us, but God knows the scenario before we face it. And so when it shows up, God is like, aha, we're at that part of your life. We're at that page of your story, and we're about to do some great things. But the challenge is a part of his plans. The Bible says this, for I know the plans I've had for you, said the Lord. Plans to prosper you, not to harm you, to give you a hope and a future. I like 
like the version says, an expected end. You can expect that God is going to show up in big ways in your life. There is an expectation that we should have as believers that when we go through diverse trials, that God is going to show up and he's going to show out. And so the Bible says this in Exodus, the 14th chapter, if you're following along, Exodus, the 14th chapter, verse 1 says this. It says, then the Lord said to Moses, tell the people of Israel to turn back and encamp in front of pi ha between Magdal and the sea, in front of bel Zephon. You shall encamp facing it by the sea. For Pharaoh will say of the people of Israel, they are wandering in the land. The wilderness has shut them in. And I will harden Pharaoh's heart and he will pursue them. And I will get glory over Pharaoh and all his hosts. And the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord. And they did so. And they did so. In other words, the Lord says, go here and camp here, and they did so. Following the directions of the Lord will get you to the place that God wants you to be so he can do the rest of what he wants to do in your life. But the focus point in all of this passage that I just read is four words. I will get glory. I will get glory. The one thing that God wants out of our lives is glory. Everything that we're going through, God just wants the glory out of it. When he blesses us, he wants the glory. He wants us to say, when you get the job, Lord, I thank you for the job. Lord, I thank you for the baby. Lord, I thank you for the new car. Lord, I thank you even for this trial that I'm facing because I know it's going to produce something good. He just wants the glory. Anytime I think about the glory of God, I can't help but think about olive oil. Mm -hmm. Olive oil. Yeah. No, not olive oil and Popeye. No, not that one. (laughs) I'm talking about the oil of an olive. Now, we all know that olive, an olive is a fruit, right? Doesn't look like it, right? But science tells me that things with seeds is, yeah, they're a fruit, right? So olive oil is literally produced by taking olives and putting weight on top of it, a heavy weight that literally squeezes it and presses out this oil. There are different types of olive oil, but the best olive oil is usually that which is cold pressed. Cold pressed because it's done slowly. It's cooled and it's cold in the process. It can't go over a certain amount of degrees. I think it's less than 30 degrees. Why do I know so much? I'm nerding out right now, Pastor, about olive oil, but literally it squeezes until it comes out of it. The thing that you saw in the beginning turns into this very rich oil. And this oil that it produces is very symbolic for the church because we use it often to symbolize blessing, to symbolize anointing, to show that God is present, that he is here. But just like the olive that produces this anointing oil, I want to let you know that often God is squeezing us to produce glory. Mm. God will squeeze you to get the glory. Turn to your neighbor and say, ouch. Mm -hmm. That's God squeezing you, yeah, to get the glory. I remember when I was younger, the commercial used to come on the TV all the time and it said, please don't squeeze the Charmin. You remember that? It was always saying, don't touch the tissue. You know how you go to the tissue, you're like squeezing it, you know, um, those people. It it was weird doing COVID, you know, going to the store shopping for fruit because I was like, how many other people have touched this fruit? And so, but with, 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 with touching and squeezing, God literally allows situations to squeeze and produce glory out of our lives. So the thing that you're going through right now, I know it's difficult for you, but what God is literally doing, he is squeezing out the glory in your life so that you can see the benefit of what you're going through. Well, what does that mean for you? Um, What does that mean to you? I'm saying to you today is that as God is getting the glory out of your life, he is not selfish in that. When God gets the glory out of your life, he gets the glory, but he gives you the victory. Oh, watch that. So in other words, God is squeezing you and everybody is watching you go through the squeezing process, but God is also getting 
you the victory for what you're going through. I know it's hard, but you got the victory. I know it's difficult, but you got the victory. I know it's been a long time, but victory is on the way. And so, just like this oil, we, we learn to allow God to work in our lives to get his glory. Trusting God is more than a phrase. It is an action. Mm -hmm. Trusting God is more than a phrase. It's an action. I, I remember when I was uh, in high school, um, I don't know about you, but um, in New York, I grew up in New York, and after you got out of junior high school, you were able to go to a high school of your choice. Some high schools, uh, they featured science programming. Some um, high schools had performing arts, and I was into theater. I still love the theater. I love the theater. It's nothing like somebody singing their heart out and crying every night at a show. Um, I just got to go to Broadway not too long ago before they closed and watch uh, uh, Paradise Square and several other shows while I was there. I, I love the theater. It's just amazing and whatnot. If you ever want to gift me with something, send me Broadway tickets. Okay? <laughs> just ideas, okay? All right. <laughs> and um, so I got to do that for my birthday recently, and that's what I wanted to do. And so I was going to a performing arts school, and so I got uh, started auditioning for all those performing arts school. And some of you guys might know some of them. Um, some of you might know about LaGuardia. LaGuardia is a big performing arts school in New York City, and um, that's where the um, the show. I'm gonna live forever. Oh, hey, all right, hey, somebody found that. Okay. <laughs> so watch out, because if I, if I, never mind. If I do a run, run, leap, I'm gonna be done, okay? So, um, but anyway, I, I, I literally auditioned for that school, um, didn't get in, um, but. But I ended up at the other performing arts school, okay, which was Sheep's Head Bay High School. Uh, great school. I was so get blessed and so glad to be a part of that community. Um, the guy who uh, produced uh, Curb Your Enthusiasm came out of that school. Some of y'all have no idea who that is. Um, which is a great, a great school itself, and I got to learn so much there. But the first day of acting class, I'll never forget going into the room, and uh, Miss Tulip, our teacher, she uh, put us all in circles, started us out with some activities, and then she broke us up into groups, and she said, we're going to do this thing because in acting, there's got to be trust. you got to believe and trust in the people that are working on the stage. People are going to forget their lines, but if they forget, you got to pick up where they leave, um, leave off. And she had us all, all there, and... She said, we're going to do this thing called the trust fall. You know what that is. It's when you stand up, you close your eyes, you cross your arms, and you just go back, right? And um, somebody was like, is he really going <laughs> to? No, trust me, I'm not doing that. And so, and so I'm sitting in this room of strangers, and I am going to allow them to catch me. And not only that, I'm a chunky boy at the time, by the way. I looked around the room and said, uh-uh, I don't think they're going to be able to do it. And so I had very, a lot of anxiousness and a lot of difficulty in trusting people that I did not know. That should be different from the believer. We know this God that we serve. We've been in a relationship with him. We've taken journeys with him. He woke you up this morning. Uh-huh. Not to mention all the mornings prior to this morning. He's taking care of your families. He's taking care of your kids. He's giving you jobs. He's protected your home. He's kept you safe in all situations. You should be able to trust the Lord. Amen? But it becomes difficult not because of us not wanting to trust God. It's because of all the other times that we have been disappointed by life when things didn't go the way that we thought they should go. Well, I wanna let you know that God is trustworthy. It's more than a phrase, it's an action. Next, trusting God will require silencing the voices of doubt. In order to trust God, you are going to have to silence the voices of doubt in your life. There are always going to be voices of doubt. There is always going to be something that says, oh, it's too late for me to do that. It's too hard for that to happen now. I don't have enough to do that. 
I, I don't have the exposure, the experience. I don't know. All of those voices will come because that's how life is. There's always somebody who will say, oh, no, 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 no. You're not smart enough for that. No, you don't, you don't have the background for that. There's always someone there. And sometimes the worst voice is the internal voice that speaks. Because we really know how to talk to ourselves, don't we? You're not that cute. You're too short, you're too tall. Your hair color is just not what it should be. And we self-talk, self-doubt, and it pushes us away from the plan of God and the thing that he has for us. The scriptures tell us in verse 10, it says this, when Pharaoh drew near, the people of Israel lifted up their eyes and behold, the Egyptians were marching after them and they feared greatly. Listen, I wanna stop there for a minute. They feared greatly. I wanna let you know, there are gonna be times that you are going to fear. But if you remember at the first passage that I read, remember, and they did so. They did what God told them to do. So meaning they got into the place where they were supposed to be encamped, they were there. Listen, it's okay to be afraid when you're in the place that God wants you to be. It's okay to have a little fear when you're in the place that God wants you to be. Every person in the Bible who has led anything great had a moment of fear or had a moment of doubt, had something that was going on in their life. Last week we talked about Noah. Could you imagine building that house? Yes, there were moments that he was afraid when that water started to rise. There had to be moments of fear. And Moses, when he had to do all that he was doing, a stuttering man going to lead a people out of Egypt, guess what? There was fear fear. And I know that we'll talk about Daniel in the lion's den. There has to be lions. Come on. Fear, right? Fear. Fear is going to be present, but fear does not equate defeat. Fear does not equate defeat. You can be afraid. I know that the Lord has not given us the spirit of fear but of love, power, and a sound mind, but fear will show up. But if you're in the space that God has called you to be, I wanna let you know you're gonna be just fine, just fine. And so they were encamped in that space. And the Bible says, and the people of Israel cried out to the Lord. They said to Moses, it is because there were no graves in Egypt that you have taken us away to die in the wilderness. Ooh, what an attack. What have you done to us by bringing us up out of Egypt? Is it not, excuse me, is not this what we said to you in Egypt? Leave us alone that we may serve the Egyptians. For it would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in the wilderness. Wow. Could you imagine? I've been putting up with all y'all stuff all this time and y'all gonna attack me today on a day like today? Moses was so cool. I got, I, got to, I got to appreciate Moses, right? Because Moses does what a great leader does. In the face of fear, in the face of adversity, in the face of a trial, Moses says to the people, fear not, stand firm and see the salvation of the Lord which he will work for you today for the Egyptians who you see today, you shall never see again. For the Lord will fight for you and you have only to be silent. You're in the place, you're in the space that God's called you to, you're afraid, but guess what? Be silent. Stop talking. Some of us just talk too much. Chatty Cathy, talk too much. Just always. And I don't know. How it's going to work. Constant, right? Just stop. There used to be a rap group that says, you talk too much and you never shut. Uh-huh, that's it. Uh, <laughs> Sometimes we just need to be silent. And I can imagine that they were anxious. Why? Because God was talking to Moses and not talking to them. God was talking to Moses directly. And I want to let you know that it's important that you hear from the Lord for yourself. 
I'm so glad of what Jesus did on the cross because of what he did on the cross, I have access to the Father for myself. I don't have to wait until Sunday morning and someone is standing on this stage to declare the word for me to hear the word of the Lord. I want to let you know that you can get a Wednesday afternoon word while you're in your car. While you're in the bank, while you're in the supermarket, while you're in your house, you can get a word from the Lord because God is always talking to us, his people. But we've got to learn to be silent because when we're not silent, our words come in conflict with trusting God. And when there's conflict, we can't move forward. We become frozen and we become like a statue because we have allowed our words to take precedent over the plan and the purpose of God. So sometimes if you have nothing good to say, as my grandmother would say, say nothing at all. Sometimes it's gonna require us to be silent about what God is doing in our lives. I know you got the bad report from the doctor, but guess what? You don't have to repeat that report because whose report would you believe in? I choose to believe the report of the Lord. Next. Just because it doesn't happen instantly doesn't mean that God is not working. I wanna go with that again. Just because it doesn't happen instantly doesn't mean that God is not working. Throughout the Bible, there are many passages about immediately. The woman with the issue of blood, immediately. There were so many situations that immediately things happen. I just want to let you know that sometimes God is not working in the immediate. I love the fact that I can throw something in the microwave and it can cook and be ready in 90 seconds. How many of y'all love that? Ooh, Lord. But listen, there is nothing like a home-cooked meal that you can smell before it's done. Mm-hmm. While you, and you're sitting there and you're like, oh, I just can't wait to eat. I just can't, I just can't wait to eat. Oh, man, I smell it. It's not ready yet. Is it ready yet? Is it re no, it's not ready yet. Oh, we got another 30 minutes. 30 minutes? Oh, my, 30 minutes? That's like forever. My stomach says now. But guess what? It's so rewarding when that plate is sitting in front of you and you're able to enjoy the thing you were waiting for. Microwave meals are just not that good. When you compare that to the meal that you waited for and is sitting in front of you. My wife is a baker. She bakes all the time. And the, listen, it starts in fall. Fall for us starts in August. So I'll let you know, like fall has exploded in my house um, and it's, it's her thing. She loves, she loves a season and she doesn't want to miss a day of it. So I think she cheats the calendar like a couple weeks. Um, but there are cookies and muffins and all that stuff coming out of the oven and you could, the house just smells of pumpkin and <laughs> all this good stuff. It's just so good. But all of that takes time and effort and it causes us to wait. Now, I should wait in between my servings, too, but that's another story. But it causes us to wait for it to come out of the oven. And so, just because it doesn't happen immediately doesn't mean that God isn't working. Let's read this passage. The Bible says this. It says in verse 21, Then Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and the Lord drove the sea back by a strong east wind all night and made the sea dry land and the waters were divided. And the people of Israel went into the midst of the sea on dry ground, the waters being a wall to them on their right hand and their left. I'm actually gonna stop right there. There's the key point to this passage is a small line in there that we miss because when we watch the uh, Prince of Egypt or we watch the Ten Commandments, when we saw it happen, it happened all in five minutes, didn't it? It was like, and maybe less because you know, <laughs> It's, 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 it's Hollywood. We got to make it happen. We don't have time. People are not going to sit there and watch this thing manifest. So we got to do it quickly. And so, so it happens quickly in those versions of the story. But in the Bible, it says that the Lord drove the sea back by a strong east wind all night. 
all night. Well, could God have done that instantly? Yes, he could have done that instantly. But notice something. You have the Egyptians on one side, a cloud, uh, a pillar of fire, and the children of Israel and the sea here. And all that night, they're waiting for the next thing to happen because the water had opened, but it was not time to move. Oh my God, hear that. See, there's some things that you're starting to see move in your life, but it's not time for you to move. The thing is moving, but it's not your movement time. And so you've got to wait on the timing of the Lord. Well, why are you waiting? Well, the sea is already open. Why can't I just go? Why can't I just go ahead and get to the other side? I'm so afraid about what's going to happen. The Lord who has you in the right place will sustain you. He will keep you. And the time for you to move, he will let you know. Well, the reality is why they had to wait is this. If you go back in scripture, the Bible tells us that when they left Egypt, when they were leaving, that they plundered the Egyptians. What does that mean? That means they took gold and silver and animals. There were so many things. They were just giving them stuff. Get out of here. Get out of here. We, we're tired of these plagues. We're tired of you people. Go away. So they were just giving them all this stuff. So they had stuff they had never had before. And they get to the sea with all of this stuff. But listen, if the Lord had not dried the land all that night, guess what? All the stuff that they walked away with would have been stuck at the bottom of the sea. Oh. You've gone through too much to lose your stuff now. You've gone through too much to lose your testimony now, to lose the blessing. I want to let you know that while you are waiting, there are people who are watching you. There are people who are watching you go through the trouble, go through the trial, go through the tribulation, and they're watching you, and they're watching what God can do in a person's life who will wait on the Lord. Those who wait upon the Lord, their strength shall be renewed. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. God is calling for you to wait. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I know you want to retreat. I know you want to get from under this thing. I know you want to get out, but guess what? Just wait on the Lord. It's so good to wait. It's so tasty to wait on the Lord because when God finishes what he's doing in your life, it won't just be for you. It'll be for everyone who knows you. Oh my Lord. Mm. Thank you, God. I don't know who that's for this morning but I feel that part right there strong. Just hold on a little while longer because God's got you. Listen to this. It's okay to wait under the weight. These two words sound the same, but they're different in meaning. There's a weightiness to the thinking that God is doing in your life. There's a heaviness to the thing that God is calling you to do. Because you've come out of your Egypt, there's some things that he's giving you that you've got to carry. And as you're carrying those things, he's saying wait. And it's hard to wait under the weight. What I've learned is that as I'm starting, I'm starting to work out, right? I'm start, starting to try to, I'm trying to live, y'all. Can I just be honest? I'm just trying to live. I'm just like, Lord, you're like, because you really just can't work all day, come home, eat great. I'm telling you, I got a wife who she throws down. And then after she throws down, I lay down. <laughs> that pattern just doesn't work, okay? And so it wasn't helping me. So now I get up super early in the morning, a God-forsaken hour. The only person up is me and Jesus. And so I'm up at literally 3.20 in the morning so I can get myself together to go to the gym to work out, right? So I go to the gym and work out. I work out with a, um, a trainer who's a great brother in the Lord and uh, Rob and, and I call him coach. I always call him coach because I have to keep my mind together. I said, if I call him Rob, I might be like, I can't make it today. But anyway... When he said coach, I got to show up for the coach. So I show up and there are times that he may say, hey, Mike, you want to do this workout? Here's a workout. He'll send me a workout. And if I go to the gym by myself, there's a different type of workout I do than when I'm with him. Mm -hmm. 
So he'll give me what to do. He'll say, hey, we're going to do some curls. We're going to do curls. We're going to do four sets of, of, of 10. And so I get the, get, the, get the dumbbells and I'm ready, right? And so if I'm by myself, it's kind of like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, right? Done. I'm done. I'm done, right? Because nobody's watching me, right? Because I just want to get it done. I want to get it finished. But if I'm in the gym with Rob, each curl is like one. Two, and I'm like, dude, can we finish this already, okay? See, the reality is that the longer I am under the weight, the greater the results I'm going to have. Mm -hmm. The reason why you need to stay under this weight for a little while longer is because the results that the Lord is going to deliver to you is going to blow your mind. It takes time. It takes a longer time than you anticipated. But while you're staying under the weight, the Lord is saying, watch what I do in you, in your life, in your family, in your job, in your school, in your community, because you were willing to wait on the Lord under the weight of the thing that you're carrying. I know that it's hard. I know that it's difficult. I know that it looks like you won't even be able to carry it. But guess what? You keep holding on. He he will not put more on you than you can bear. So if you got it, baby, you can carry it. Trust this. God is after the results in your life more than he's after the speed in your life. Some of us, we're just rushing, rushing, rushing. We're running, 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 going, rushing, speeding nowhere. And the Lord is like, just take your time with me. Walk with me and trust that I am producing something in you that's going to be great. As I get ready to close, I, I reflect on a time where I saw God, take me past my point, my breaking point, and do something big. Well, we was at camp meeting in, at Whitehall in Pennsylvania, and um, that's in Edmonton. It's one of the Church of God campgrounds, and I was a speaker there, and I was going to be speaking the whole week, and some of you might have been there before, a great camp meeting, but I'll tell you one thing, those people work you. If they ever invite you to speak or do something, just know you're going to work. Oh, you're going to work. So I had to preach 14 times, and I had to lead a class for five days. So when it all was said and done, I was in front of people 19 times the whole week, right? And so uh, great experience, but I was tired. By Saturday night, I was like, listen. I was like, you know, you guys who look on Instagram, you always see these little commercials where people are like, I want to go home. That's how I felt. I, was, I just want to go home. I just need, need a way. So we strategized, my wife and I, we strategized that like after service, um, instead of me going down and trying to fellowship, and because you know who I am, I'm just saying, hey, how you doing and all that, and get more zonk than I already was, I was going to call her up. We we're going to come up stage. We we're going to pray, and we was going to exit stage left, right? And that's the plan, right? So we do that. She comes up, we pray, dismiss the folk, but then there was this lady, an elderly lady coming down and somebody was accompanying her and she was coming down to the front and I said, okay, what's happening here? This wasn't a part of the program, this wasn't a part of the service. And so I could tell that she wanted prayer. Okay, we can pray. We know how to do that, we can pray. And so she came down and we went down and we, we, we were just like, okay, what is the need for prayer? She takes out her hearing aids and put them in my hand. And I'm looking like, okay, now what am I supposed to do with this? And she said, they don't work. They're not helping me. They're not helping me. And she wants us to pray for a hearing. So I'm sitting here, I'm like, okay, I don't do miracles. <laughs> That's not my, healing is not one of my spiritual gifts. That's not something I really operate in. I'm, 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 that's not, I'm outside of my territory right here. But guess what? I don't have to know how to do it because God does it. And so we prayed and I, the Bible says, it says call on the elders. And so we called on the elders and other ministers to come and circle this woman. And we prayed for her and we laid hands. And I don't know if this in, is in the oracles of, of camp meeting there, but I could tell you one thing that that woman left that place hearing that night, 
hearing that night. Now listen, that sounds so distant. I could tell you there was more that happened. There was a young lady who wanted somebody to pray for her pawpaw and we prayed for her pawpaw. And, and um, it was a beautiful thing because he was very sick. But then in that moment, there was a man who came up who wanted prayer. He had cancer and, and the Lord was like, hey, Mike, you're not supposed to pray for this one. This young lady is to pray for him. And when she prayed, oh my, the beautiful faith that this young girl had and prayed for this man. And I believe the Lord touched his body. But hey, it's not isolated to that moment. In first service this morning, we prayed and anointed a woman who walked in who needs a knee replacement. And she knows she needs a knee replacement. She came up and there was prayer for her. They anointed her and prayed for her. And she said she knows she needs a knee replacement. She came in hurting and limping this morning. But guess what? After first service, she walked out of here not hurting and not limping. Amen. Yes. It's available to you. There's so much that God has for us. And just like the oil press that we talked about earlier that produces a symbol of the anointing, a symbol of the blessing of God. Now we know there's no power in the oil, but it's the symbol of it because it's so beautiful to put on us what's going to come out of us. So we anoint for the anointing to come out of us because God plans to bless us. He plans to heal us. He plans to deliver us. It's in his plan for he knows the plans he has for us. Plans to prosper us, not to harm us, to give us a hope and an expected end. I love that part, an expected end. You can expect God to do what he said he would do. Whatever the Lord has promised, he will deliver. For he is not a man that he shall lie, nor the son of man that he shall repent of anything that he has spoken. Do you not believe that he will do that thing? So if God says he's going to heal you, he will heal you. If he's going to deliver that son, he's going to deliver that son. If he's going to restore that marriage, he's going to restore that marriage. If he's going to do whatever he said, it's done. You can count it as done. This morning, I want to let you know that we do serve a big God. He's a big God. And yes, he has produced some big stories in the Bible. But I want to let you know the biggest story that has ever going to be written is not the story that you will read in the Bible, but it's a story that you will experience. Ooh, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Ooh. God is writing a big story in you, in your life in your home, and others are watching the story being written. And that story is big. It's so easy to get distant from Noah and the ark because we haven't seen that. We've seen floods, but we haven't seen that. It's hard to get away from Moses and seas parting, but it's not hard to get away from you when you see God move in your life in big ways, when he does what only he can do. I love the fact that God likes to operate in the impossible. Whatever is impossible, that's the thing that God says, hey, I'm about to do it in you. He always shows up when you can't do anything else. But trust him. Trust him and just wait under the weight. This morning, we want to anoint you. Would you stand with me? I know that many of us have come into this place and you didn't come by yourself. You brought stuff with you. You might have brought your sickness, your illness. You might have brought the heaviness that's going on in your life. You may have brought the concerns of your family, concerns of your friends, concerns of people that you love. And some of us, we just brought ourselves. And we know that we need a touch from the Lord. We need the reminder that the anointing that's on me is going to come out of me in due time. This morning, I'm going to pray for you. And after I pray for you, if you would like for the team to anoint you, we believe in healing here at Church of the Crossing. We believe that God can do the impossible. It's not just stories in a book, it's a reality for us here. And so, if you would like to be anointed, 
we're going to ask that you would come down the center aisle and someone will guide you to the places and when you can go to be anointed in this service. But I want to pray for you. Can we pray? Is anybody's faith stirred right now? Oh, I feel, I feel the stirring of faith in this place. I really do right now. That God is going to do some things. You're going to go home and see some things are different. Even before you get home, it's already changing. Things are changing on your job already. Oh my God, I thank you, God. God, we love you. We adore you. We thank you for being in this place and for your presence that reminds us that you are a big God and you are building big stories in our lives, Lord God, that there's nothing too hard for you, Lord God, that you're still doing miracles, oh God, that you're still opening up our seas, oh God, and you're still allowing us to walk on dry ground. God, I pray right now for whoever came into this place carrying something, oh God, whatever it is, oh God, I pray in the name of Jesus, oh God, that the weight that they're carrying, oh God, that you would allow them to be reminded that you will not put more on them than they can bear, Lord God, that you are strengthening them even now, strengthening their spirit, man, strengthening their physical, man, strengthening their mental ability, their emotions, oh God, I pray in the name of Jesus, oh God, that you would saturate this place with your presence. Holy Spirit come even now. Do what only you can do in this space. We know that healing comes from you because you are the acting, moving power of God. Holy Spirit heal, deliver, set free. Move about this space and let us know that we were not just in a service, oh God, but we were in the presence of the Lord. God, we love you with everything that we got and we are counting on you. You have us in the right place this morning whether we're in this room or online. Lord, I pray that the one who's online this morning, who may be home or somewhere, would, Lord, go grab something just as a symbol to even anoint themselves. Because the same God who's here is the same God who's there. And you will not leave us alone. Have your way. Bless us, your people. We love you and we thank you in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen.